My name is uh, Murat Fudim. I'm a cardiologist uh, at Duke University. I'm a heart failure cardiologist to be specific. And the name of my uh, study is Rebalance HF. It's an endovascular ablation of the greater splenic nerve and it's the role in cohort that we presented today. The intent of the uh, endovascular ablation of the splenic nerve uh, surrounds the concept of volume distribution. We now uh, know that cardiac decompensation is really not just a result of volume overload, but it's a result of volume distribution. And that's a concept that is um, based in the uh, vasoconstriction of vasculature. So when you vasoconstrict, particularly the venous vasculature, you are uh, causing distribution of blood volume from the periphery into the chest, which then causes elevation and filling pressures and can exert itself a either as exertional limitation with exercise or maybe even a cardiac decompensation leads to heart valve hospitalization. So rather than the addition of wa water and salt, here it is simply the distribution effect that leads to this concept. So we have done a series of studies in the past. There were short-term studies few hours a day and also surgical resection of the same nerve which have demonstrated as a proof of concept that we can lower pressures in the heart, we can uh, lower pressures in the heart during exercise and we can sustain the lowering of pressures throughout 12 months when you resect that nerve with direct visualization. So we know that the splenic nerve induces some of these distribution effects and if you get rid of nerve, you might actually prevent some of the distribution effects. Thus, it's a declared target. So, enemy number one now. The study population here is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction of HFPF. Specifically, it's patients with an ejection fraction of 50 and greater. They had to have um, some form of cardiac decompensation in the past, whether it's a IV, IV diuretic administration in the last year, heart failure hospitalization, or they simply had an elevated anti-pro BMP. Having said that, the exclusion and inclusion criteria for this study are not very stringent, but the key inclusion criteria is that they had to go on the cath lab table and do supine ergometry, so bike exercise, supine, with a catheter in place to measure the pressures. They need to have it elevated to filling pressures. This is how we really, really know as a gold standard whether a patient had heart failure with preserved ejection fraction by meeting this. It's not an arbitrary cutoff, but certainly very well uh, established cutoff to determine uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So 25 and greater, they had to meet that. That was the hardest criterion to meet. The procedure in the study, we refer to as uh, SAVEM, it's, it's splenching nerve ablation. And um, here, we take a transvenous femoral approach. So you enter the vein in the groin, you drive it up to the SVC, and then down the azygous vein. The azygous vein is a branch that leads into the SVC. You can drive this catheter all the way down into the encostal vein of T10 and T11, those are the levels. At that location, the veins intersect with the nerve, the greater splenic nerve, or GSN, in a relatively fixed anatomical position. You know, there have been enough cadaver study, preclinical studies, and clinical studies that indicate that the anatomy of the nerve and the veins is relatively fixed. And because they're fixed, we can simply use landmarks to position an RF catheter. RF means radio frequency. You turn on the device and it heats the tissue. The nice thing is there's not much down there besides the nerve, the vein you located in, and then the pleura that's close by, but the heating is not that high to induce any damage really beyond the local uh, nerve that is very close in proximity, a couple millimeters to the vein. So you heat up the nerve, you destroy the nerve on one side, just the right side, and that's the entirety of the procedure. Procedure duration is anywhere between 20 to 40 minutes uh, in, in the study for the, for the entire procedure. The population was predominantly female. They met all the inclusion criteria of sort of true HFPF. They uh, had an average age that was above 70. They had a lot of comorbidities as it's typical for a 70-year-old patient with HFPF. The anti pro BMP was only in the 300s, not that high. This was a predominantly exertional population with class 2, 3 heart failure. We found that when we ablate the nerve, at one month follow-up, which was the predefined time point where we again repeat the hemodynamic testing, we found that there was a drop in wedge pressure, that's the left-sided pressure in the heart. That wedge pressure dropped by about 8 millimeter Hg in average in those 18 patients with either low-grade exercise, which is 20 watts, or with peak exercise, uh, which was around 8 as well. The median was lower, was five and two at those individual time points. It was highly statistically significant between those two, um, those two, uh, those two endpoints. 
And then we also looked at quality of life. There was a, um, an improvement in quality of life at the one and three mark. There was an improvement in um, there was an improvement in six minute walk distance, but it was not statistically significant. There was an improvement in NYHA scale uh, by about one point and about third of the population. And the anti MP has not changed in the three months of follow up following the baseline procedure. Then also to speak of safety, which is very, probably something that your listeners uh, would want to know about. As to safety, so all 18 patients had a successful ablation. So we were able to access the vein and ablate the nerve. We suspected what the nerve was ablated in most cases. There's actually no confirmation of technical success besides the actual pressure coming down in one month. A. B. There were three device-related complications. Those were pain. One patient actually got, uh, got admitted to the ED shortly after the procedure because he got a lot of fluid during the procedure and the diuretics were withheld. It's a mistake that we wouldn't repeat going forward. And um, that's pretty much it. And there was a hypertensive episode during the procedure, which is associated with pain. Thus, we do the procedure under anesthesia. So all those procedure-related effects were self-limited, not sustained. So that, is, I think, is a very good testament to the procedure so far. The conclusions to this is that this is the open label run-in to a larger pilot randomized controlled study. So the role in cohort is uh, now um, followed by an 80 patient randomized portion. That randomized portion, we don't have currently the data. We are more than half enrolled into the study. We should have the data by the end of the year and then follow up completed by next year. So the conclusion here is, you know, this is open label data. It sounds very uh, reassuring because it confirms prior single center and dual center data. So clearly encourages us that that signal we see is, seems to be reproducible. But because it's open label and device procedures tend and are certainly having a sham or a placebo effect, we need to do one or two randomized control studies to really in a large, uh, in a large fashion to confirm the findings. Um, so a sham control study is following and I'm excited to be able to share the results next time.